Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this On Aging Conversation. I'm Barbara McMillan, Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team. I'd like to start by acknowledging and expressing appreciation for the opportunity to live, work, and gather on the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada. On Aging Conversations is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you missed earlier episodes, you can find them on Apple Podcasts and on Healthy Aging Corps Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. And the lineup of On Aging Speakers on Core and links to the recordings, along with a lot of other interesting and useful information, can be delivered to your inbox if you're signed up for the twice monthly Core Canada e news at www.healthyagingcore.ca. In our work with CORE, HelpAge, and the extraordinary network of community-based senior-serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals across Canada, we're privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging, such as today's guest, Dr. Samir Sinha. And so On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it, a 30-minute conversation with a featured guest providing healthy aging information, ideas, and inspiration every two weeks. And I'll now turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of HelpAge Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb, and uh, welcome everyone. HelpAge Canada supports community-based initiatives through its partnerships across Canada and abroad to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And we are particularly interested in aging in place and indeed aging in the right place, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm just thrilled to be welcoming our guest, Dr. Samir Sinha, a colleague and one of the leaders in our sector in Canada. Dr. Sinha is the Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network in Toronto, a Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and the Director of Health Policy Research at Toronto Metropolitan University's National Institute of Aging. He also was appointed to serve on the Government of Canada National's Seniors Council in 2021 a Rhodes Scholar, and recently led the development of Canada's new National Long-Term Care Services Standard. Welcome, Samir. Thanks for having me, Gregor. Well, I know you to be a person who likes to adventure a little bit and do a little traveling. What's been your latest sojourn? The latest sojourns have actually been to Miami, of all places. Oh, and mainly because my partner has been working there over the winter. And so it's given me an opportunity to connect frequently, but in a warm and lovely climate. So many of my patients are snowbirds and I've decided I'm going to start figuring this out for what it's all about. And I have to say that our oldest are our wisest who know the value of being constantly in a warm place if you can do it. So I'm I'm exploring that as a future lifestyle opportunity as well. Hey, that's fantastic. Well, nothing like Miami. That sounds awfully good right now from Ottawa, where we're still covered in snow. So sounds like a great adventure. NIA, the National Institute on Aging, recently published a fantastic report, Aging in the Right Place, Supporting Older Canadians to Live Where They Want. And I mean, it's fantastic. I think it's worth folks just to pick it up. You can get it on the NIA website, and it really makes such a great case. And we were using the word aging in place for some time. And I think it's really interesting that the report has seen an evolution to aging in the right place. I'm wondering if maybe you just like to say a few words about that. What are some of the insights towards what aging in the right place signifies and how we might move towards implementing recommendations? Yeah, I think when we start talking about aging in place, you start realizing that, are we all saying the same thing? Because when you start looking through the literature, we realize that there's not even one commonly accepted definition, and this can mean different things to different people. And when we started thinking about it a little bit more, uh, we sometimes get so honed in on the idea that the only thing that's good is the idea of aging in your own home for as long as possible. And while that is what we all want, if you look at the polls, nearly 100% of older Canadians say they want to stay in their own homes for as long as possible. There are situations where staying in your own home might not be the best place or the right place for you to be. It may be in a more supportive housing environment, for example. It may be receiving care or supports, again, in another location and through a different mechanism. And so that's why we wanted to kind of really reframe this as not just talking about aging in place, but aging in the right place. So we recognize the importance of respecting people's autonomy and understanding what's important to them 
them, but also making sure that we're not neglecting potentially the unmet needs of an older person uh, by giving them the best possible opportunities to age in the best way possible. So that's how we reframe the idea of aging in the right place, is really focusing on helping people stay in their own homes for as long as possible, but also helping them to navigate living situations to what is best for them and what makes most sense for them as well. Right often a staged approach or not insisting, say, that people just stay in their home because that may not always be the the best solution. That really makes a lot of sense. One of the statistics that just jumps off the page, even in the executive summary, is that up to 30% of older adults admitted to long-term care homes across Canada may have well been able to remain in their homes and communities. And, you know, had we been able to provide a better home and community care supports. Now, I'm wondering if you can help us better understand that group of 30% of older adults. And what are those? How can we help improve home care to keep people in their communities for as long as possible and until that right time comes uh, without compromising the quality of life? So that's a great point, Gregor. And I think it talks about this complexity about the idea of aging in the right place, because I will have patients of mine who there comes a time to say, it's not working well at home anymore. We don't have the right mix of services available in the community. You may not have the family supports. You may not have the financial resources. So we need to look at a more supportive environment like a long-term care home, like a retirement home where you might get access to important things like you know being part of a social network or a social community. So those are conversations where I, I where I talk about the right place being a more institutional care setting, for example. But that's a rarity. What's more common is actually seeing people who are prematurely institutionalized. So we actually default and almost try and push people into care homes or remit homes way too early. And often in a situation where if we did more things and better recognized and met their needs in the community, we would not have had to have them go into a long-term care home as early as they did. So that's a stat that you're talking about that that Kai Hai or Canadian Institutes of Health Information have come out with, saying that upwards of a third of people entering homes uh, are basically those who probably could have been supported in the community. Mm -hmm. So to your question as to what sorts of supports could that look like, Sometimes it's just about getting a bit more home care. So sometimes our home care services are so limited, for example, that people can only get maybe an hour or two at most a day, where in places like Denmark, for example, they'll provide you up to five or six hours of care a day. That may sound crazy compared to what people experience in Canada, but it's actually cheaper to keep a person home with four or five or six hours of care a day than it is to institutionalize them here in Canada, for example. That's the first part is about having access to home care, but also it's about looking at the other services that might be helpful. So we talk about community support services, and that could be that broader network of things that could be everything from friendly visiting services to meals on wheels to access to adult day programs, um, a whole variety of things that can actually help people stay more engaged and connected, maybe even transportation services to get around one's community. We also look at the importance of having good access to medical care, such as primary care that if you're homebound can even come into your own home or support you to get the access to primary care that you need. And finally, we also sometimes even talk about other unique models of care and support that can be helpful, like the role of the growing role of community paramedics across Canada, where these are folks who are highly skilled, but often can provide some kind of supports that can help a person who might have some medical or other needs be better supported in their homes and avoid having to go to the hospital hospital or ending up in long-term care settings. So so often there's this whole ecosystem that when we actually really allow it to do what it can do by funding it appropriately, making sure that people are well-connected to it, we'll often find that we can better meet many of the needs of older people and their caregivers as well. But when we starve that sort of the system, you can imagine now why we actually have these two stats I'll give you. We have currently 430,000 Canadians who report having unmet home care needs. And then we have 52,000 Canadians currently on long-term care home wait lists in Canada. And you don't have to be a mathematician to say, oh, wow, if you have close to half a million people who can't get their needs met at home, 
No wonder people are ending up on these long wait lists. But if we actually met people's needs at home, maybe these wait lists wouldn't need to be as long. Maybe we wouldn't need to be building as many beds as we're talking about building today. I, I remember visiting an older woman here in the Ottawa area, and she was a blind person who had, you know, lived her life fiercely independent. So I was there and I remember she had her medication on the table and sort of set up so that she could feel it out by hand. And I went into her fridge to get something. There was uh, some, some jam there and the jam was all filled with mold in the cupboard. And immediately you respond. And you think, oh, this poor person, gosh, it must be just so challenging for her to live on her own. But really what it was, was she just did that some extra support at this stage of her life at home to help her with her food, with her groceries, to monitor these kinds of things that she was no longer able to keep up with, help her with her medication, house cleaning. It was almost like pre-social prescribing to sort of wrap her with a number of services and people checking in that allowed her to stay at home. And it would have been just the, an easy solution to put her on this and move her into a home. And this is somebody that people may automatically kind of come to a judgment or conclusion, oh, well, it'll just be the, the solution to go into long-term care. But this is, you know, five years ago, she still is living independently with the assistance of her community and, and actually plays an, an active part in her community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think this is the challenge is that we often are our own worst enemies, if I can put it that way. If we if we think about this person and putting her into a long term care home, it would cost all of us together about two hundred dollars a day to support her to live in a long term care home. Home care for a, a long term care eligible client in Ontario that provides at least three to four hours of care a day costs about a hundred dollars a day right now in Ontario. So our own Ministry of Health, for example, actually says that it's actually cheaper to keep a long-term care equivalent person in their own home than it is. It's about half the cost of caring for them in an institutional setting. Now, imagine if you gave this person four or five or even six hours. That's why in Denmark, for example, they say, wait a minute, if you're spending half the cost is about three hours of care a day, but for double the cost, it's still cheaper than actually caring for them in a care home. Well, why don't you do that? Because then all of a sudden you start thinking about, wow, with that kind of funding and that support, we could bring in a variety of things that could support this person. And and you're right, you know, you remind me, I had a 99 year old patient who came into hospital. She was blind. She lived in a tiny one bedroom apartment in downtown Toronto. And I'm I remember meeting her in hospital and we were all like, how does this woman exist at home? She's blind, yet she's living at home. And people were really keen to just have her go to long term care because we just couldn't wrap our heads around how she's able to live at home but anyways. But she actually was part of a home visiting team that provided house calls and they had a very good setup that worked really well for her and where she would actually have a home care attendant who'd come in three times a day morning, afternoon, dinner time. They would prepare a meal and give her her meal and help her support her, give her her medications. And with three hours a day and a nurse who'd visit twice a week and a doctor who'd visit once a week, she was able to make it work and it worked really well. But I remember getting a panicked call one day because somebody had assessed her at another hospital once and then they determined that she needs to be in a long-term care home. And so they, she was actually put on a list and she was going to be placed. And so her family doctor called me and said they've actually deemed her incapable. <laughs> they've actually said that she needs to go to a long-term care home. And I'm really afraid that they're going to push her into one. I need your help. I was after the clinic. I went over, met her in her home. She was there living in her hospital bed. And I met with her and I asked her, I did a capacity assessment with her and with her family doctor. And she said I could share her name, but I would just share her first name, Josephine. I said, Josephine, you're living in this hospital bed. I said, and you're blind. How does this work? She's like, it works really well. I've got a personal support worker who comes in three times a day to see me morning, afternoon, bedtime. I'm like, if you need help in between, what do you do? She says, I have a phone right beside me. But she said, I have this button around my neck. I push this button, that will get me emergency help. She says, because I'm blind, I can't see the buttons on the phone, so I can't call out. But if someone calls me, I can answer the phone. And I'm like, huh. right. And I said, but you're just here on your own all day long. What happens if something happens? happens in between. She said, well, if something happens in between, something happens in between. I said, well, wouldn't you rather be in a long-term care home where you could actually get help anytime? She says, I've heard things about them. I don't want to be there. She says, I'm quite happy where I am. I listen to the radio. I pray. And she said, I like this. And she says, I know I'm getting about three hours of care a day. I hear that's more care that I would get in a long-term care home. I said, you're actually right. 
Does that sound like an incapable woman to you? Hardly. <laughs> and, you know, I deemed her not only capable, but we were able to continue supporting her like that for a few more years. And she got what she wanted. And we were able to honor her wishes. And But we were able to allow her to age in the right place that was the place for her. And that was her own home, even though other people around it, including medical professionals, couldn't necessarily think right at the front that that was even possible for a lady like her. So like your lady, I've seen these cases and it really kind of bothers bothers me a lot when we don't take extra time to figure out what could work and honestly what would be more cost effective for all of us as a society if we made it work as well. Yeah, well, I think there's some structural work for us to do because I think although there are trailblazers out there, the report cites Ontario's Prince Edward County, their rural route reassurance program with letter carriers that keep an eye on folks in the neighborhood. And I guess the system works that they have a number to call or they're able to, to contact somebody to follow up if they notice something's amiss uh, with a person as they're bringing their mail, an older person. I mean, what a great and natural idea that could be developed further? or Are those areas that you are continuing to explore or engage with? Absolutely. And, and this is the idea that, again, how do we need to rethink what we're doing in a positive way to support more people to age in the right place? Because in our report, we talk about four key pillars that yeah. are really important for us to focus on. Number one, we talk about the importance of making sure that people have access to the home and community care supports that they actually need. We talk about the importance importance of also making sure that we're also supporting wellness and health promotion. So how do we keep people healthy and well and help them to manage their chronic diseases? We talk about the importance of combating social isolation and loneliness. And finally, we talk about the importance of having the right mix of housing and other support services, for example, like transportation, housing, and those sorts of things. So, so it's the idea that there's four kind of key things that we need to think about when we think about aging in the right place. And to that point, you know, they're talking about the letter carrier program, the letter carrier alert program in Prince Edward County. That's something that was happening in a number of other communities on a voluntary basis with post workers. And it's a great program because, again, the post workers know their roots, they know their clients. And if they identify that someone isn't picking up their mail or something might have happened, it's not their job, not healthcare professionals, but what they want, but they're obviously concerned. They're mm -hmm. members of the community and they want to be helpful. And so they call a local community support service agency that will then do the follow up and that support to make sure that that person's okay. And those little things give people a peace of mind. It gives them a bit more so connection. They feel more engaged in their communities. They it feels like someone is looking over them and eat it. And that reassurance can give people more of the confidence and peace of mind to age in their right place. And so is that a model that's worth thinking about more? Absolutely. For our paper called Special Delivery is one pitching that this is an idea that Canada Post should really pursue. And we know that the Canadian Union of Postal Workers are very keen on this model. And it's one that's been well established in Japan and France, where their postal service has actually run the service as a subscription service uh, yeah. so that people people actually are interested in, in receiving a wellness check from a postal worker can pay for their place. In fact, in France, it's called Watch Over My Parents is the name of the program. And in the Isle of Jersey in the United Kingdom, the health department found that this was actually such an effective program. They will subsidize this for everybody so that everybody who needs it can get two free visits a week. And then if they want additional ones because they just like the companionship, they can pay for those on their own. So this is an example of leveraging an already dedicated mobile workforce to be able to provide a greater level of social connectedness and support in our society. And I think these are the kind of creative ideas that we need to get so that, again, we're not discounting older people. We're not discounting older people's desires and, and wants to age in the right place or in their right places, if you will. And it helps to counter, I know, a topic that we like to talk about often about ageism and ableism. It's recognizing that people often know what they want, but when when we're in a society that doesn't enable these sorts of things, then we're actually not only doing a disservice for these older people, we're actually ending up doing things that end up costing us all more when we institutionalize people in more costly settings then allow them to live in their own homes and communities and be more active members of their community that costs us all less and enriches us all more.
I'm just reading actually Breaking the Age Code by Dr. Becca Levi, I'm sure a colleague of yours, and a fantastic book on identifying ageism. And she has just some amazing statistics. They did a 2002 longevity study in Ohio that saw medium survival rates go up 7.5 years higher within people that had positive beliefs about age, twice the risk of cardiovascular and respiratory illness in people that have adopted poor attitudes towards aging. People themselves, older people themselves who hang on to these ideas and as a society at large, our uh, structural ageist views are affecting our health, our longevity, but also our capacity to find these solutions and work together to age in the right place. No, absolutely. And I think it's important because if we start understanding like what's behind these views, for example, uh, it's almost that we defeat our own selves when we adopt some of these views, because again, when you're living in a society that discounts older people, that doesn't really respect their roles or their contributions, and has a lot of messaging saying you're, pa you're past your best before date now. Yeah. <laughs> so therefore, what is the use of you? When some people internalize those feelings, it's understandable why a number of people might actually start thinking that aging isn't a good thing, and they don't see it in a positive light. But you're right. I think when we when we show people and support people to age to, as active members in their society and, and show that we will provide the supports, we will provide the services there, that you are important, you are valuable, and we focus more on the positive aspects of aging, I think then we can enable more people to not harbor those views that kind of almost the rest of society kind of almost forces onto them, which can then have further negative implications in terms of how they receive care or how they're even willing to accept care as well. So I think there's a lot to be said about the way we look at aging, the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at others. But I think certainly developing better positive attitudes will help all of us have healthier society as we all age. One more thought at Help Age, one of our real areas of focus is on social connectedness and our programs, uh, digital literacy, our Canada Home Share program, our granting programs, uh, men's sheds, age-friendly transportation is all about trying to address this isolation and loneliness and the thinning of social networks of people as they grow older and how can they participate participate in, in community. And in our international work, we've been able to discover all kinds of really interesting programs overseas, all over Africa and Asia. In India, there's these really neat new models of communities where older people, regardless of religious denomination, can live together. They can, they can even do their own little micro farming or businesses, and they work together in these communities. And I think that in, in Canada, our society can be so fragmented and individualistic that that we have a different cha challenge in a way of, of trying to overcome these barriers of of social connectedness, regardless of the uh, generational or or in aging. I wonder, you know, in some of your work and uh, nationally and internationally, have, do you have some insights about? you know, best practices for engaging people, improving social connectedness as they age. Um, and for that matter, of course, aging in the right place. Yeah, I th you know, again, this is, it's such a key part of, of how we need to think about aging is the idea that as, you know, just this longevity dividend that we've been blessed in, that we're going to likely live uh, healthier and longer lives also comes with that added risk that you might actually outlive family members and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't, uh, if you don't live in an intergenerational household or intergenerational community, um, and you don't actually, say, have children or have a large family, you're at greater risk of, of becoming more isolated as you age. So knowing that, knowing that reality, and as you talked about, having maybe more individualistic approaches to living and in some Western societies, these things all put us at increased risk of loneliness and social isolation. One of my favorite stats is that one in four older Canadians does not have a family member or a friend who lives close at hand mm -hmm. uh, to help them with a basic task like getting a prescription mm -hmm. filled. So when you realize you know, the level of vulnerability, it really then points to a huge opportunity. Because then you start thinking about how, how we look at all the programming that we do and how that programming, you know, can in many cases help start to address some of these issues. So like a lot of the work that you talked that Help Age is doing, for example, you're just bringing people together. By bringing people together through a social activity, something of a shared interest, you might make a new friend. That new friend can then become part of your social network. They might actually 
be willing to have a coffee with you. They might be willing to pick up a prescription for you later on, you know, doing those sorts of things, uh, you know, and, and through things like men's sheds or other things, you're helping to build communities and build networks because it's that network of support that then helps you emotionally. It can actually help you practically uh, and, and then leveraging other infrastructure. Like we talked about postal workers, um, you know, the natural, you know, kind of natural um, uh, things that exist. Uh, these are the things that can do well. And, and even home share. I love that model where, again, you've got people who might be overhoused, if you will, like a person who might be living alone in a three bedroom house because the kids and, and, and their partner may no longer be living there, whatever the case is. And all of a sudden they can actually provide somebody else, you know, uh, you know, low cost housing, but that person is also doing it on the agreement that they can support that older person um, with some social companionship, but also, um, you know, helping them with chores and doing that. So it becomes a win-win for everybody uh, when you actually look at these models. And I think this is that creative out of the box thinking that we need to be leveraging more of over time because it's not rocket science. What we talked about in any of these examples, none of this involves robots. It doesn't involve artificial <laughs> intelligence. It doesn't involve like, it's just doing practical things that help build social connections. And I think we, as we start thinking about more ways to empower aging in the right place, it can't just be about putting more home care out there. It can't just be about making sure people have a house to live in, for example. It can't just be about, you know, making sure people stay healthy and well. It, again, that fourth pillar in aging in the right place is all about uh, social connectedness, combating social isolation and loneliness. And so I'm glad that we're focusing on that because I think that allows people to know that they're valued, that they're supported um, and uh, and doing these sorts of things allow us uh, to more older people to age in a healthier way. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, and, and you know, it's also true uh, as, as you, as, as we began the conversation that um, we are, have to manage that if we are if we spend some time in Miami for a couple of months in the winter, we we have to start to build our network there too. Well, know? absolutely. Which wherever is, you go, and you know wherever you go, it's 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 always important. And and I think these these month little sojourns where I get a blast of hot air and and also get to meet interesting people. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a way to to build a network. Uh, it's a way to kind of um, stay active and and engaged. Uh, and I think the key is is that. Um, again, you know, we, we, we should always be thinking about our future, living in the moment, enjoying what we have, but also keeping an eye to the future of how we can continue to stay socially connected and well. Fantastic. Well, Samir, it's always a real uh, pleasure to get to chat and hang out with you a bit. Uh, thanks so much for taking some time with us today. This has been just extraordinary. And of course, we never seem to have enough time. We're just scratching the surface. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Thanks again, Dr. Sina.